Revelation chapter 15 this evening. So if you will turn in your Bibles there, uh, Lord willing, we may, we'll see how it goes, but we may get through 15 and maybe even 16 tonight, so we'll see. But Revelation chapter 15 is where we are, so turn in your Bibles there, and then uh, let's pray and commit our time to the Lord. Father, it's good to be in your house this evening, and those who are watching online, joining us that way, we just together come before you grateful. Uh, Lord, we want to be mindful of your many blessings and the ways that you are so good to us. And we just commit our Bible study to you now that you would use this time in your word to strengthen our hearts as we read about these things that are to come, that we would be ready, that we would be prepared, that we would be watching. You even tell us, lift up your heads and look up because our redemption draws near. So help us, Lord, not to cast our vision here uh, horizontally, that we can get discouraged about things we see on earth, but help us to always cast our, our, our gaze upwards to you. We continue to pray, Lord, that you would help to sort out the things about the election. We just commit our nation to you. Uh, Lord, we pray for an end to this virus. We just ask for your mercy there and that you would just continue to encourage us and help us and guide us. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, let's visit our timetable on the back wall here, which uh, breaks down the book of Revelation. And as we have been for the last several weeks, the largest section of the book of Revelation is right here between chapter 6 and 18, and it has to do with the seven years of tribulation. So that's, that's where we are in our Bible study here in chapters 15 and maybe even 16 tonight where God predicts, he tells us that there will be a time coming upon the earth that will last for seven years, that will be a, a time of awakening for those who are still here, uh, and God will use different natural disasters, cataclysmic events, just um, unheard of things that will transpire upon the earth. Um, many people will refuse to believe, many people will believe, uh, but it is God's final a wake-up call to try again to reach as many people as possible. And so that's the period we're in right now that, that we're looking at. We're not in the tribulation period right now, uh, but we're, we're looking at this part in Scripture. And, and so um, God's wrath will be revealed during this tribulation period through a series of three different events. And we've already talked about the seven seals that are broken. That was chapter 6. When a scroll is, is broken, there are seven different wax seals broken, and uh, there is a, an announcement of a different judgment with the breaking of each seal. And then there was the, the, the blowing of seven trumpets. Um, that was chapter 8. And we're coming up to now, here in chapter 16, uh, the final series of God's wrath, which will be poured out through a series of bowls that angels will be pouring out upon the earth. And so that's chapter 16. Now, before we get to chapter 16, chapter 15 is somewhat of a preview of the things that are to come in chapter 16. So uh, I'm going to read it, and then we'll come back and, and unpack chapter 15. It's only eight verses, so follow along as I read. John writing here, uh, by uh, virtue of the of inspiration of the Holy Spirit and virtue of his own um, visions that he sees here that God shows him. So verse, verse 1 of chapter 15, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints." Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. And after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, 
And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. And then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Okay, so again, this is like a preview to what we're going to see transpire in chapter 16. But this is a heavenly vision that John sees here because that's back at verse 1. It says, that, then I saw another sign in heaven. So that's where this, these events are transpiring. This is not something happening on earth. He is writing here about what he sees in heaven. And he says it's great and it's marvelous. And he says there in verse 1, seven angels having the seven last plagues. Now, it's interesting, you know, you don't want to make too much of the study of numbers, uh, but numbers often do mean things in Scripture. The number seven is used here not once, but eight times in chapter 15, and there's only eight verses. And, and so the number seven is a number in Scripture that often indicates perfection or completion. And we're going to see here that something is coming to completion because when he sees these seven angels and they have the seven last plagues, the, these are coming to an end. These are the last of the plagues. And he, and he adds, therefore, in them, the wrath of God is complete. The wrath of God is complete. It's interesting that word complete is the same Greek word that is used in John 19.30 when from the cross, Jesus said, it is finished, that the work of God is complete. Now, on the cross in John 19, 30, when Jesus said to telestai, meaning it is finished, he means the whole redemptive work of God is now accomplished by virtue of his, that is Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Uh, in this case, what is finished here, same Greek root word, teleo, is the wrath of God. God's wrath is going to be now done. And um, it's intense, but he is now bringing it to a completion. And it, it is a good reminder for us at this point that, to just look real quickly at Psalm 85, 5 and 9. I put it on the screens for you. Because God's wrath does come to an end. And the psalmist writes here in Psalm 85, will you be angry with us forever? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. And so there is this uh, soon completion here of the wrath of God and uh, his, his mercy is going to prevail here, but in his judgment and in his attempt to arouse a, a um, deaf and, and complacent world and a Christ uh, forsaking, rejecting world, he is going to pour out one last series of his wrath by virtue of these seven angels with seven plagues. And verse two, and I saw something like Okay, it's not actually, it's like a sea of glass. And I mentioned to you before, whenever you see a mention of a sea in the book of Revelation, it almost never means a body of water. It usually means, and it is the case here, the sea of humanity. So he sees, he glances at a vast number of people, and it looked like a sea of glass. But this case, in this case, it's mingled with fire, which is a, an indication of judgment. So he sees at the sea of humanity, he sees judgment and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, 666, standing on the sea of glass. So they're among those 
that he sees there among the sea of humanity, having harps of God. Some translations say having harps given to them by God, which is kind of an interesting thing. Like you, you might get your own harp when you get to heaven. That whole idea of angels in heaven playing harps, there is some truth to it. We see it right here. But the those in this verse, in verse 2, who does he actually see here who have victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name? These are the the, those who have been martyred during the tribulation period. So he sees the saints who have been killed. They accepted Christ while uh, they were on earth during the tribulation period. But as a result of receiving Christ during the tribulation, they were martyred for their faith. And now John sees them in heaven. And he sees them playing harps. And he sees that they've had victory over the beast, over his number, uh, over his name, over the mark. And they're singing. So this is a beautiful picture of redemption here. While, while, you know, this horrific shedding of blood happens during the tribulation period, and, and those who come to faith in Jesus are martyred, they are killed for their faith in Jesus, that's not the final answer. You know, that's not the last chapter, because always we need to hold on to the fact that though we will die physically, our spirits go to be with the Lord. And these, these tribulation saints who were killed during the tribulation, they've gone to be with the Lord. Their, their bodies were, were killed, but their spirits went to be with the Lord, and they're going to get a glorified body too. And so John sees them in heaven around the throne of God, this like sea of humanity, and they're playing harps, and they're singing. And they're singing the song, verse, verse 3, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So there's this uh, beautiful song here that they're singing that is, you know, co-written between Moses and Jesus. And uh, so they have the copyrights on this song, and it's their intellectual property, and, uh, and they're singing this. Now, it's interesting, in your Old Testaments, there are two places where it is recorded that Moses sang songs, that he had written songs, in Exodus chapter 15 and Deuteronomy chapter 32. So Moses must have been uh, somewhat prolific in songwriting too because Exodus 15 records the song of Moses. Deuteronomy 32 records another song of Moses. And here we have yet another one being sung in heaven. And it's kind of a beautiful combination. A lot of Bible scholars, when they, when they see there the, the song of Moses, uh, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, you know, say this is, this is a song that blends the law with love. You have Moses who represents the law and the prophets. You have Jesus obviously who represents grace and the love of God. And the two combined here uh, have this song that the saints in heaven are singing. And the song between uh, their verses uh, 3 and 4 are basically about three things. And you can note these words in your Bibles. It's about the works of God. It is about the ways of God, and it is about the worth of God. And that word is, is found in terms of the word worship, and I'll show you as we go. So they're singing, great and marvelous are your works. There's the first thing. They're ascribing honor to God because of all the mighty things that he has done, his works. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. I don't know the tune or I would sing it for you. <laughs> or I'd get... Ben or Micah or somebody else is singing it for you. Uh, just and true are your ways. So they're not only honoring God for his works, they're honoring God for his ways, in, in, in the ways that he operated, in the ways that he, uh, that, that, that he led and loved and guided and guarded. And so just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. Are, are holy. This, this mentions now the worth of God. For all nations, all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So God is making his judgments known on the earth through the series of the tribulation period. But that's what this song basically is, is honoring, the works of God, the ways of God, and the worth of God. So the saints are singing this. So if you, if you don't like music, you better get used to it because you're going to be singing in heaven and, uh, and playing harps. And, and so maybe for now, if you feel like, I can't really sing, maybe it'll be translated in heaven and you'll be able to sing well for the first time. Um, we hope so, at least, so that you don't distract the rest of us. But anyway, <laughs> verse 5, after these things I looked... He still sees more visions, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, 
clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. So this is a scene here of these seven angelic creatures. They are coming from within the temple. It is a picture of they are being dispatched by God. They are coming out of the place of holiness. And they are about now to um, distribute these different plagues upon the earth as, as God has assigned them. And, and I'll just put verse 7 up on the screen because, because the next verse here, this is what is happening. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So um, these golden bowls are probably the golden incense bowls of the priests. So in the uh, tabernacle of the, in the temple of the Old Testament, one of the articles of the, of the uh, temple were these uh, golden bowls of incense that the priests uh, would carry the, this, um, this aroma, the incense, unto the Lord. And it is believed that those are, the, those are the, the similar kind of bowls that are being used here. And it's interesting there in verse 7, it talks about the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls. Well, back in Revelation chapter 4, we were introduced to these four living creatures. They were very different and uh, unique uh, beings, and they are, again, angelic beings. So they're of somewhat of a different order. There's, there seems to be a hierarchy of angelic beings in the Bible. And these four living creatures were the ones who were around the throne of God. So they have now been entrusted to take these golden bowls and give them to these seven angels and, and, and to assign them then this task of pouring out the full wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So it's quite a heavenly scene here with, with sights and sounds. Um, you know, John's senses are being overwhelmed here as he writes all these things and, you know, angelic beings and, uh, you know, smoke filling uh, the, the temple area, the glory of God and uh, being manifest there in this way. These, these tribulation saints who are now in heaven, their spirits there with harps and they're singing songs unto the Lord. So, it, you know, it's, there's, there's some noise going on. There's, there's some activity happening for sure in heaven. But what is about to happen on earth is, um, is, is, is rather intense and, and sobering here. So as we move into chapter 16, here we go. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. And so this is, you know, this is somewhat symbolic. They are pouring out these bowls and it is an indication of God's judgments being poured out upon the earth in seven uh, successive events. And when you look at chapter 16 here, it seems to be that each bowl is being poured out rather rapidly. It is happening uh, rather intensely, successively, uh, pretty quickly because um, the effects of bowl number one is still being felt when bowl number five is being poured out, which indicates to us this rapid successive series here that is, that is happening. So there's not any, there's not any uh, you know, downtime between these bowls. It's happening one after another after another as God pours out these series of judgments upon the earth. And uh, so here we go. I'm going to give you the summary of each bowl and then we will read it and talk a little bit about it. So here's the summary of bowl number one. Ugly and painful sores break out on all who have the mark of the beast. This is what verse 2 tells us. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Uh, by the way, this is very similar to the sixth plague of Egypt. When you look back at some of the ancient plagues that happened in the book of Exodus when God was working on Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to release the Hebrew slaves, uh, he, Pharaoh was reluctant, and so God poured out a series of 10 different plagues upon the Egyptians. You're going to see here 
uh, some similarities between those plagues in the book of Exodus and the plagues that are coming upon the earth here in Revelation chapter 16. This is very similar to the sixth plague of Egypt when boils broke out on people, sores broke out on people. Some Bible scholars look at the words here in verse 2, which talks about a foul and loathsome sore and believe that it's an indication of some kind of malignancy, that whatever happens that breaks out upon people, it is restricted to those who have taken the mark of the beast. Remember, we read earlier, you can't buy or sell during this time without receiving the mark of the beast and his number is 666. So there's some kind of thing that happens on your forehead or on your right hand that allows you to buy and sell. And there's been great debates about, you know, modern technology and chips and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but whatever it is, if it is uh, something like that, those who have taken that mark are identifying their allegiance and loyalty to the beast, the Antichrist, and not to God. And so God is selectively here uh, pouring out this bowl upon those who had taken the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Bowl number two. The second bowl is the sea turns into blood and every living thing in the sea dies. This is verse 3. Then the angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Uh, now, this is very similar when we were going through the trumpets, the trumpet judgments. This is very similar to the second trumpet. When the second trumpet was sounded, a third of the sea became blood. In this case, though, all of the seas become blood, and every living creature in the sea died. Now, you have to remember, by the time we get here uh, to the bold judgments, you have more than half of the world's population gone. They've either died or the church has been raptured. So you have somewhere upwards of 4 billion people have already died. And now those who have remained here are, are going to feel the effects of what is happening globally, and it impacts humanity. Obviously, when the sea turns to blood and you have every living sea creature dying, I mean, that's a great food source for, for the world, dead. I want you to also imagine the stench. Blood itself smells, but now you add on top of that uh, every sea creature dead, I mean, the foul odor that'll be upon the earth is just unimaginable, but that's, that is the second bowl. Here's the third bowl. The third bowl is rivers and streams become blood, so drinking water is polluted. It's one thing for the seas to become polluted, but now the fresh water is going to get polluted here with bowl number three. Look at verse four. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord, God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. It's interesting that these angels are affirming God in that they're worshiping him and saying, you were just in turning the fresh water to blood because these very people killed the prophets and killed the saints. And so they have shed blood and now you're giving them what they have done to others. You are giving them the blood to drink. And so in that, God is being just in this. Now, it is interesting to note uh, that the earth is, is, is covered, se about 70% of the earth is covered by water. About 70% of the earth is covered by water. 97% of that is salt water. The remaining 3% of water on the globe is basically locked within the polar ice caps and glaciers. Humanity, check this out, humanity basically survives today on 1% of the water on the earth. That's what sustains humanity. Basically 1% fresh water upon all the waters of the earth. So you have to understand how fragile the whole fresh water 
uh, situation is, even now. And so when it gets turned to blood here, um, it's going to obviously affect the ability to drink uh, fresh water. So uh, this, by the way, is very like, uh, very similar to the first uh, plague against the Egyptians in the book of Exodus, when um, uh, the, the Nile River was turned to blood. Uh, now this is more extensive than that, but again, there's similarities here. The fourth bowl, the fourth bowl is people are scorched by the intense heat of the sun. If you look at verse eight, it says, then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire and men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. Now, before I talk about this actual plague, I wanna point out a few things about those last couple of sentences. And they did not repent and give him glory. Two times in the book of Revelation, that phrase is found and both times here in chapter 16, in verse nine, and we'll read it again in verse 11. That despite the fact that God is putting on the squeeze here, it is one last attempt to awaken non-believers. There will be people in their stubbornness who refuse to repent who refuse to humble themselves and bow their knee and acknowledge that God is great and superior and awesome and just and true and holy, they refuse to repent. And in fact, look at what they also do. Uh, if you back up uh, in the middle of verse 9, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. Three times in the book of Revelation, it talks about how people on earth blaspheme the name of God, and all three times are found here in chapter 16. It's verse 9, 11, and 21. We'll come to it as we continue to read. But I want you to notice that not only do they reluctantly refuse to acknowledge God as Savior, in the process they also blaspheme Him. They're cursing God. They are mad at God. He's the only answer to what is ailing them, and they are cursing the very one that they should be bowing to. This is a, this is a very sad kind commentary on the state of humanity. But you know, in a, in a smaller sense, because this obviously is, is, a, is a time that is unparalleled, but in a smaller sense, it's not too indifferent from the way a lot of us are. You know, God over and over again tries to get our attention, and we refuse to humble ourselves, and instead we start getting angry at Him and blaming Him for things, when in fact what we should really do is, be, is to bow our knee and humble ourselves and surrender to Him. These people here refuse, many of them. And so here's what's happening in, in the fourth bowl. People are being scorched by the intense heat of the sun. And it's interesting, if you write in the margin of your Bible, Isaiah 30, verse 26, right here. I'm going to read to you what Isaiah 30, 26 says. Because Isaiah also saw this day. God showed the prophet Isaiah a, a, a scene of the end times. And Isaiah writes this about the intensity of the sun. Listen, Isaiah 30, verse 26. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. So when you compare Isaiah 30, 26 with what is happening here, it seems to indicate that the intensity of the sun gets ratcheted up seven times. Now, what happens on the planet when the sun is seven times hotter than it presently is? Well, not only do people get scorched, but think what happens. Uh, yeah, people get scorched for sure. There's not enough sunscreen that's going to help that day, I guarantee you. But Dr. Henry Morris, uh, who's written some great commentaries on the book of, of Genesis and the book of Revelation, he died in 2006. I had the privilege of meeting him once. Uh, but he uh, was previously uh, the deputy, uh, the department chair of civil, of civil engineering at Virginia Tech. And he wrote a book called uh, The Revelation Record. <clears throat> and as a civil engineer, he calculated the effects on the planet if the sun were to uh, be intensified seven times. And what he wrote about in his book, The Revelation Record, is that the great uh, ice sheets on Greenland and the entire continent of Antarctica would melt. Now, when you have all of that melting happening, if the sun got seven times hotter, 
and the polar ice caps and, and, and the glaciers melted, it would raise the sea level, according to his calculations, by 200 feet. 200 feet. Now, this is a, I'm going to step aside so you can see it. This is a, um, a study that was done, put out by St Statista, about um, what would happen by the year 2100 if sea levels, because their, their data is using the potential of global warming. So just global, you talk about global warming, it's when the sun gets seven times hotter, okay? If you weren't really want to be biblical about global warming, it's in Revelation chapter 16. But anyway, if because of global warming, the sea levels rise just two feet, just two. This is their data chart as to the number of different countries that will be affected and the number of people who will be affected because of rising uh, uh, seawater. And, and in, in totality, they're saying by 2100, by the year 2100, if we're still here by 2100, I kind of hope not, to be honest with you. Well, I know for sure. <laughs> well, either way, I'm not going to make it to 2100. Um, I don't have another 80 years in me. But... Um, but, th but they're saying that over 200 million people w will be in jeopardy of dying because of, the, of the, the sea level rising just two feet. Now, if it rises 200 feet, I, so I started Googling and looking at how many uh, cities around America are well within 200 feet of sea level, and just even presently, I just looked at the ones, let's just look at some that are under 100 feet. Um, look, New York City is only 33 feet above sea level. It's eight and a half million people who will be underwater. It's, they're just 33 feet above sea level. Miami is just six and a half feet above sea level. They have 471,000 people living in Miami. San Diego is only 62 feet above sea level. Of course, New Orleans, they're, they're seven feet below sea level. Corpus Christi is seven feet above sea level. Galveston, Texas, seven feet above sea level. Savannah, Georgia is 49 feet above sea level. Jacksonville, Florida, 16 feet above. Tampa, Florida, 48 feet. Or Orlando, Florida. Mickey is going to be completely submerged, my friends. Listen. I mean, think about, and those are just a few cities in America that are under 100 feet above sea level. So if the waters rise 200 feet, like Dr. Morris is calculating, I mean, you're talking major metropolitan cities, millions and millions of people who are going to be inundated with floodwaters. Bowl number five. The fifth bowl is darkness covers the kingdom of the beast. It says in verse 10, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And here we have it again, verse 11. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. You know, what is it going to take, right? So darkness covers the kingdom of the beast. Um, not sure exactly what this means. Um, some think it means just the area of Babylon, um, because the Babylonian uh, empire kind of emerges again. We'll get into that, uh, Lord willing, next week into chapters uh, 17 and 18. Um, how much of the globe does this affect depends on how much the kingdom of the beast it's referring to here, but darkness uh, covers the whole earth. Um, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, uh, Jesus says that uh, hell will be outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is somewhat of a preview of hell that God is giving people here. This is also, by the way, similar to the Egyptian plague number nine, when darkness covered the land there of Egypt. Plague number six, the, the sixth bowl is poured out and the Euphrates River dries up. Demons entice kings of the east to wage war against Israel in the valley of Megiddo. This is now the battle of Armageddon. So verse 12 talks about the sixth bowl. Verse 12 says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, these are demons, like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, 
that's Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Jesus speaking now, behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Okay, so what is happening here? When the sixth bowl is poured out, the great Euphrates River, which is over in uh, what is ancient Mesopotamia, so it's, it's over in, in Iraq, um, it dries up. When that river dries up, it makes now a, a dry pathway over which kings from the Middle East and the Far East can now come against Israel. And that's what happens. Now, for you who love like Bible prophecy and end times eschatology stuff, in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Ezekiel prophesies about nations that come against Israel and in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it speaks about Russia, Turkey, Eastern Europe, and the Northern African Islamic nations like Libya, Ethiopia, and Northern Sudan, and that they will attack Israel. But listen, Ezekiel 38 and 39 is talking about at the beginning of the tribulation. And when those nations come against Israel, God destroys them. Now, what we're reading about is at the end of the tribulation. Okay, Ezekiel 38 and 39 talk about nations that converge against Israel at the beginning of the tribulation. Now this is at the end of the tribulation. And this time, nations are coming, they're crossing over the Euphrates now because it's a dry riverbed, and they're coming from the middle and the far east. These nations now, probably Islamic nations and their allies, we're talking Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and China. They are coming now to wage war against Israel, which is not just a war against the Jews, this is a war against the God of Israel. Ultimately, this is a war against the God of Israel. And they will gather there at the valley of Megiddo. And right there in, uh, at the valley of Megiddo, which is also known as the valley of Jezreel, there is this ancient fortified tell. It is this ancient hill upon which uh, successive civilizations have built uh, fortresses there. And so now when we go to Israel, it's one of the places we stop. We go to Megiddo and we, and we look out over the valley of Megiddo, the Jezreel Valley. And that is where this climactic battle will happen. Uh, the Jezreel Valley is about 14 miles wide and about 25 miles long. And all these different nations will gather there. And in fact, the Bible tells us that it ends up spilling over down in the Kidron Valley on the outskirts of Jerusalem. So this is going to be this, this uh, you know, end time, last final battle here, the Battle of Armageddon and um, where these nations converge uh, against Israel and really the God of Israel. And, uh, and so uh, Jesus then says here about how he's coming as a thief. You know, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather there at the place called Armageddon. Uh, there's, there's much to say about the battle of Armageddon, but our time has escaped us. So we'll have to talk about the battle of Armageddon next week, friends with another cliffhanger here at Cornerstone Chapel. All right, let's, <laughs> let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this time in your word, and thank you that you've given us a preview of these things to come. And uh, Lord, once again, we just always pray whenever we go through Revelation that our hearts would not be weighed down, but instead we would see that your mighty hand is at work one last final time trying to awaken people who have rejected you. So Lord, we pray that even now we would search our own souls, our own hearts, to make sure that we've not rejected you so that we might be ready whenever you return to take your bride from the earth, to keep us safely in heaven while these things happen upon the earth, Lord. May we be ready and watching. May we look forward with joy to your imminent return. And until that time, Lord, may you find us faithful, doing your work here on earth for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. God bless you all.